Now, when you want to create a sketch, what you need is a flat surface to begin with. Later, I'll show you, you can project a sketch that was drawn on a flat plane, on a plane or flat surface. You can project them onto the curved surfaces. But if you want to start the sketch, you cannot start it on a curved surface to begin with. You can project on curved surfaces, but you cannot start the sketch. So you need a plane or a flat surface. Okay, any flat surface or plane can be used. Now, in the beginning, when you go to Katia, so this is Katia, and we go to Start, Mechanical Design, and then Sketcher. Okay, when you go to this environment, initially you are given the three planes x z y z and x y where x y is the top plane then we have y z to be the front plane and x z to be the right plane okay so you can choose any of these guys in the beginning although i'll show you that you can create planes in addition to these there is a command in Katia that can create almost any type of plane at any offset, any angle, with any condition that you want. But to begin with, let's just focus on any of these. Let's say, for example, the top plane or XY plane. So all I need to do, since the sketcher is clicked, you see the sketcher environment, the command is clicked, it's orange here, this command. Since this guy is activated, all I need to do is to either click on the XY plane here or here on the spectre. It doesn't matter. Once I click on it, then I now go to 2D. And all I can see is normal to the XY plane. And I see the grid in the background. And now appears the toolbars of the sketcher. Okay. So the main toolbars of the sketcher are these three guys that you can see. Now let's restore everything just to make sure. So here we restore position. We want to make sure that we got everything. I also recommend if you can see the sketch tools, if not, grab it from the bottom. The user selection filter could be interesting. And then as I said, these three filters. These three toolbars, I'm sorry, for constraints, for uh, basically profile base, you can see them here. And then for the, um, let's see, the name of this guy is operation toolbar, if I'm not mistaken, you can see the names here. Yeah, so the profile toolbar, the sketch toolbar, the operation, yes, toolbar and the constraint toolbar. These four toolbars plus the sketch tool toolbar. So these five toolbars, they have some interesting things that we need to talk about. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna talk about projection, constraint, and other stuff later. What I want to talk to you is using the basic commands in these toolbars before I go any further. So. Let's get it started. So if you want to create sketches, the main toolbar is this guy, profile toolbar. You can create almost any sketch that you can imagine using the commands here. So let's go over them one by one and I explain them to you. The first command on the top is profile. Profile is used when you want to draw a bunch of connected lines, okay? So once you click on this guy, then you can start anywhere that you want and then you can draw a bunch of connected lines okay and whenever you are done so it's the end of the profile wherever it, the profile is closed or open you double click okay so you see simply i click move the mouse click move the mouse and click on each one of these endpoints whenever i'm at the very last endpoint i double click and there we go i got the profile Okay, so this is the profile, a bunch of connected lines. Now, 
If instead of that, you want a single line or you want a bunch of lines that are not connected, okay, so let's say three parallel lines or something like that, then you would use the line commit, okay? So let's get rid of this. How do I get rid of something that I made? I can do control Z, but another easy way is if I drag a simple rectangle like this, around all the stuff that I want to get rid of and basically highlight them, select them, right? You see they are white now. White means they are free. When they go orange means they are selected. You see now they are orange. And all I need to do now is use the delete from the keyboard. There we go. They're gone. Okay, so that's a very fast way to get rid of sketches. So as I said, if you click on the line command, now you can draw what? A line and if you click more now we can draw more lines right so that is the line command yeah good now let's talk about several things that are very important one if you saw when I click on the line this sketch toolbar got some extension look when I click this guy gets bigger and now, not only I can click on the beginning point, the end point, and determine the line, another way to determine the line is by providing four values. One is the horizontal H coordinate of the starting point. The other one is by V or vertical coordinates of the starting point. So using the first two numbers, so look here, you see I can move my mouse freely, right? But once I set it to 20, look what happened, and enter. So I type in 20 for the H and enter. Now look, my mouse cannot go freely. It can only go vertically up and down. Why? Because I set the H to be fixed at 20. Then if I fix this at, let's say, 40, then the starting point cannot even change. Look, now you see one point of the line is fixed. So how do I determine the line perfectly now? I provide the length of the line L and then I provide what? The angle of the line. So now if I say, you see the endpoint can move freely. Now if I say I want it to be at 100 mil length. Now look, although it can move, but the length of the line cannot change. In other words, the point is only moving on a circle. And then all I need to do is to provide the angle. So now let's say I want at 45 degree angle. There we go. And now the line is completely defined. Another thing that you notice here, and we're gonna talk more about it is, now that the line is completely specified, all the info about the line is passed, the color of the line is not white anymore. It's green and green we're going to talk about it, as I said, it's called fully defined. It means all of the info about this line are provided. In other words, now I cannot move this line. I cannot rotate it. I cannot change length. I cannot do anything to it. Okay. Of course, if I want to change any of these numbers I provided, I'll show you. All I need is I double click on that number. A window appears and then I can type the new number. But just I cannot drag the line and move it around or change its properties. Okay, we're going to talk more about fully defined, underdefined, overdefined, and so on. But this is, I wanted to show you that the sketch tool also, or let's say circle. When I do a circle, I click on the circle. First, you see it is asking about the center coordinate. Right? And then now it is asking for a point on the circle, or you can specify the radius if you want here. And there we go. You got the circle. Okay, so that's one thing I wanted to mention. What else is important? The other thing is, you saw me when I wanted to draw three lines, I clicked on this command three times because each time I click on it and I use it, so I click one time and the command turns off. You see right now the command is orange, it's on. But once I use it one time, look, it goes back to off. So each one of these commands, when you click one time on them, they turn on, you use them one time, and then what? They go off. 
And you might say, well, if I want to draw 10 lines, should I click on this guy 10 times? Not really. What you need to do if you want a command to stay on as long as you want it, then you turn it off yourself instead of each time it goes back off. Instead of one click on the command, you double click on the command. So here, look. I double click. Now look. Here is one line. You see, it doesn't go off. Yeah, so I draw as many as I want, and then when I'm done, what do I do? I either click on the command to turn it off, or I use the escape from the keyboard. There we go. Any other command is also like that. When you double click on them, they stay on as much as you want. Then you turn them off yourself. Okay, so that's the importance of double click, the importance of double click. What else? So if I want to draw a line again, or a circle, let's say, you see, when I want to put the center of the circle, I can click anywhere that I want, anywhere. But sometimes you might notice that you can only click on the grid lines and now nowhere in between. Why? Because here in the sketch tools, there is this tool here called Snap to Point, the second one from the left. If this guy is on, you can only select the grid points as one of your points. Look, I turn it on. Now look, you see it jumps from 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 to 20. You never can have 42.67. So whenever Snap to Point is on, you can only click on the grid points. Whenever you want to click in between, you turn it off, and now you can go anywhere that you want. So that's the other thing, snap to point. Okay? So we talked about the snap to point. What else? The other thing I want to mention is uh, construction element. What is that? So... We have to talk about it more later, but it's just important to just mention it at least. This is the third command of this toolbar, sketch toolbar. So see here, I draw a circle like this, and it is solid white. So it is a sketch element that I can use later to convert to a 3D object, like I extrude it and make it a cylinder, or rotate it and make it a sphere, or something like that. But... One other type of elements that we have in a sketch, they are called construction elements. What is that? So if I click on this circle, activate it, and then now I click onto this, convert into a construction element. Look. Now, instead of solid white, it goes to uh, dash lines and gray. Now, this is a construction element. What's the use of this? Con construction elements are elements that you use to help you position the sketch elements where they want to go, especially when the sketches are complicated. Like what? For example, let me tell you. Let's say you have a sketch like this. Let me turn this off. You have a sketch like this. And then inside this one, you want to draw a bunch of circles where the center of all of these circles are on another circle. So this is what you do. You draw this circle for the centers and you convert it to construction. Now, you click here at the center, you see? Now, when I move my mouse for the center of this small circle on the construction element, what happens? I get this extra symbol that you can see here. So look, right now it's just a cross, but when I move it here, you see a double circle appears. The double circle is coincidence. Means now the center is on this big circle. And now look, I draw, and let me turn this off. I draw a small one here, and then I can, for example, draw another one here, right? And then I can draw another one here, and so on and so forth, right? So this one, I do not really need to use 
to convert it to 3D or anything. It's just there to help me define the center location of these other elements. Okay, or let's say I have a symmetry axis. Okay, so for example, I have this circle and then mirror image of that with respect to a line is another circle. So for example, and when I want to mirror something, as we're going to see in this lecture, this is the mirror command in the operation toolbar. So what, what I need is for the mirroring axis, I use the axis command, not the line command. So I use the axis command. So this is also a construction element. So now if I choose this one and hold down control and select this one, if I click on the uh, mirror, let me do it this way. There we go. You see? So what I really want here is these two circles, but I have a relation between them, which is symmetry with respect to this line. I do not want to extrude this line or do anything to it. I just using it as a help. So if you see anything that appears gray, dashed line or dash dotted line, these are construction elements. You cannot convert them to 3D. They're just there to help you. And we're going to use this guy a lot more as we go through this semester. Just wanted you to know about the construction element. Good. Then what? Now, under these uh, profile elements, some of them have these small black triangle, which means what? They have a bunch of more commands. It's not just a rectangle here. So you click on rectangle. Then you click on the top left corner, drag, and click on the bottom right corner. There we go, right? Or you click on top right corner, move down to the bottom left corner, or any corner, and then to the opposing corner, right? So this is one way to draw a rectangle, but that's not the only way. Another way to draw a rectangle is instead of draw, going from one vertex to the, to the opposite vertex, if I click on the center rectangle, sometimes you know where the center is. So you click on this one, and then you click here, and then what? You move it to one corner, and there we go. That's now a center rectangle. Okay, so, and we're gonna go through some of them. So some of these commands like rectangle, circle, espaline, ellipse, line, and the point or dot. They have several versions, varieties of commands. So we're gonna go over them one by one and I show you the application of each. Okay, just wanted you to know that it's not just here like eight commands, it's each one of them has several. So here you have a bunch of like probably 30, 40 commands at least to draw almost any profile that you can imagine. And there are more tools here and here to help you specify your sketch 100% accurately, okay? And we're gonna talk about this user selection filter later. So right now we have a sketch tool, at least that one is covered. There are a few other commands in it which are not super useful at the moment for us. We'll talk about them later. What as I need, we need to focus on is the profile. So in profile, we have seen the corner to corner rectangle, center rectangle, then we have oriented rectangle. So this rectangle is always vertical horizontal edges. Look, we can never rotate it and put it at angle. If you want a rectangle at angle, then use the second one. So this one, you draw the first edge first, then you draw the second edge by extending it. So still rectangle, but at angle with respect to the x-axis or edge axis. Then we, of course, have parallelogram. So sometimes you don't want a rectangle. You want a what? You want a parallelogram. You can do that too. Okay. What else do you have here? Well, sometimes you want elongated holes. These are also very, very useful tools. Okay. For many shapes. So here is like a circle, but elongated. So it's a combination of circle and rectangle. So you click on the first center, then you click on the second center. Then you move it up to determine the diameter. Okay, so these types of members, these types of shapes are easily drawn by a straight elongated 
circle and then the radial version, this one, which is interesting. So here you click on, first you define the circle, that is the center of the elongated hole. Then you draw the arc, that is the center arc. And then you give it thickness, right? So you create something like kidney bean or so. And as I said, these are extremely useful later. Because if you want to do this with primitive tools, then you have to draw two arcs here and two arcs there and constrain them. Okay, so drawing this takes some time if you just want to use the arc command, one of these that I'll show you later. But using this command, it is extremely fast and powerful. Then you have a keyhole. That is another interesting command. Okay, so this is good for keyhole types. And then finally, one of the most useful ones is polygon. So this is for a polygon. So you click on the center, then you go out and what? Determine the size of the circle that is completely inscribed in the polygon. And there we go. Now here, what you can see is it only gave me a hexagon. What about if I want a pentagon or octagon? So here, I click on the command again and I set the center. And now if you see this sketch tool, which is extended now, it has this number six, which is the number of sides as gray. Therefore, right now you cannot change it and you are just uh, forced to draw a hexagon. But if you look toward the very right side of the toolbar here, this guy, which says the number of sides and there is a lock. If you click on this lock and turn it off, okay, so now, let's see if I can move it somewhere that you can see the whole thing. So now as I come here and determine the size of the circle inside, now look, it allows me as I move my mouse along the circle to what? You see here, I'm changing the number of sides. So I can go anywhere from three to as large as I want. So let's say I want a pentagon, so I type in five or I choose five over there and enter and there we go, okay? So once you click on that small right-hand side icon which says lock the number of sides and you unlock it, now you can change it to any number of sides that you want. Okay, so we have seen the profile, we have seen any command under the rectangle, now we go to circle. Now the base circle you have seen, so you click at the center and then you move and click on one point on the circumference and determine the radius by that. So this is the simplest circle, very easy. Now sometimes instead of that, you need a three point circle. So you do not have the center and the radius, all you have is three points on the circle, okay? So let's say you know the circle passes to origin, passes through, let me turn the snap to point uh, on, passes through this point 80 and negative 60, and it also passes through this point negative 40 and negative, one, negative 150 and negative 40, okay? And there we go. So you just click on three points, and many times when you want to fit a circle to, uh, to one that is already there, this is a very uh, good tool. So it has its own applications. You can also have circle using coordinates. The other one is circle that is tangent to three lines. That is also an interesting one. So let's say you have one line here, you have one line here, and then you have one line here. And now you want to draw the circle that is tangent to all three. So you just choose the three lines and there we go. Okay, so that is another very useful tool that you do not see in many other software. Then we have arc. Now there are three types of arc. One is the center arc. So you click on the center, then you determine how big the radius of the arc is. And then by moving your mouse, you can determine basically the angle of the arc. So this is one way. There are two other ways using three points instead of center and radius. One is the one starting with the limits. The other one is three-point arc. Now, 
the difference between these two is the order of the points you are clicking in. So this one that I use most of the time, the second one from the right, you first click on the two end points, then on the third point, okay? And one of the applications of that is, let's say if you want a shape like basically a rectangle that has a semicircle at the end. So here I have the rectangle, I get rid of this line, and now I want to connect these two points together using a semicircle. So I click on the three point arc, click on this one, click on this one, and then move it until I see that the circle is tangent to the lines, and there we go. Okay, so this is a very useful tool. Now the other one is a little bit different. So if you look at the other one, you click here, then you click here, right, and look. So if you see, I clicked on the uh, one end point, then I clicked on the center point, then I click on the second end point. While here, on this one, first I click on the two end points, then on the midpoint. It doesn't need to be center point, just a midpoint. Uh, 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 sorry, a point in between, really. So this is typically more useful than the other one. So this is for drawing arcs and uh, circular arcs and uh, circle full, is full circles. Now let me skip a spill line for a second because I need to explain it later. But uh, here we have ellipse, we have uh, parabola, we have hyperbola, and any other conic section, okay? So as I said, for ellipse, you click on the center, then you determine the major radius and the orientation by clicking on one end point of the main diagonal, and then you click on one other point on the ellipse and get the minor diameter determined. Okay, and then you can have parabola, hyperbola, and so on and so forth. But um, you know that each one of them is a separate thing, right? They are different type of curves, although we call all of them conic sections. But each one is a quite separate thing, right? So, for example, if you remember from your math courses in high school, geometry courses, you remember that if this is XY plane, then an ellipse with a semi-major diameter A and semi-minor diameter B, the equation for it, if it's centered, that origin is X squared over A squared plus Y squared over B squared equals 1. Or if it's a hyperbola, then it said a plus 1 is negative 1, equal 1, uh, negative, the uh, first one minus the second one is equal to 1. And then parabola, depending on the direction of it, one of these terms is actually a linear term, the other one is a quadratic term, and then some of it is equal to, or the subtraction of it is equal to zero. Okay, so we have seen about the line. Now, as I said, you can do an infinite line. Also, instead of just a line segment, and when you click on it here, you can basically have the first point and then the next point on the just two points on the line right so that was a single point but here let me do this infi infinite line so here if you click on one point and then the next it creates an infinite line with the same procedure that you did the line segment this creates an infinite line and you can also force it to be completely vertical like this or click on this one force it to be horizontal okay so this is an infinite line the other one is by tangent line which is tangent to two curves at the same time let's say you have two pulleys right and you have one here and then you have one there and then let's say these guys are connected by belts and belts are tangent to both so what you need is click here and then click on the top points of each there we go you see here this double equal sign means tangent and then you do it for the bottom points here and here and there we go now you have like two pulleys connected and running by the belt so that is this one and then um, you can have two lines that are intersecting like this and then draw a line, an infinite line that cuts the angle between them in half, bisects. 
So you click on this line and this line, and there we go. Infinite line cuts the angle in half. Finally, you have normal line, which is perpendicular to a curve at a given point. So if this is an ellipse, you want to draw a line that is tangent, that is normal to the curve at the point you are clicking. Like that. There we go. So if you draw a tangent to the ellipse at that point, this line is perpendicular to that. Okay, so that is the normal line. We know axis is used for symmetry and as mirror feature, which we're going to show you later. Point, you have a single point by clicking. You have the point by uh, inserting is H and V coordinate. You have equidistance point, distant point. So these are, this can be done when you have a curve along which you want equidistant point. So if I get this ellipse back, let's say along this ellip ellipse, I want 20 points equidistant. So I click here, click on this one, click on the ellipse. And then I say I want 20 points or 25 points with equal distance on the ellipse. And there we go. Now I have all of them, right? You can see each one of them here. Okay, so that is its own application. You can, of course, have project a point onto a curve and have the intersection curves too. So let's say I have this ellipse and then I have this circle. And I want to know where the intersection points of these two features are to profiles. So I click here and then I choose ellipse and circle. And there we go. You see at the intersection now I have these two points. Okay, so hopefully you know now about different uh, point commands that exist in Katia. Finally, uh, we go back to SPLine. SPLine is a smooth curve that passes through a bunch of points at which or on which you click. So here, let's say I start with this point and then I click on a bunch of points. And whenever I'm at the end of the SPLine, I double click just like profile to finish it. And let's do another one here. And when you move each one of these points, the shape of the SP line, so you just need to drag it. The shape of the entire SP line would change accordingly. Okay, and then you might wonder, okay, where is this guy used? So it is used in a lot of different applications, but probably the one that you can immediately recognize, especially since you're A students, just from what I made here, of course, it's quite a bad version, but you can probably guess that an airfoil is one of the places that SP lines are used. So an airfoil has a top SP line and a bottom SP line, but in real life, there are hundreds of points, several hundred, seven, eight hundred or more that will define the SP line and the coordinate of them is exactly calculated. So the SP lines of airports, they are not just passing through five, six, 10 points, through several hundred points. But that's one of the places that use SP line. And the major point about SP line is the word smooth. So what do I mean by smooth? Smooth, and what type of curve is this, by the way? What kind of curve? Is it a circular curve? Is it a sine curve? Is it an elliptic curve? What kind of curve is this SP line? So the SP line that you see here is basically called cubic SP line. And cubic means cubic what? It means cubic polynomial. They are polynomials. So the equation of y versus x of that is something like this. And then... If you have one piece of SP line like this and then another piece of SP line like that where you clicked on these three points and you passed SP line. So first thing is between any two points that you click, you have one cubic SP line. 
So it's not like the whole thing is a cubic function. No, each section of it, each section between any two consecutive points, each section is a cubic polynomial. And then why do we call it smooth? Smooth means at the intersection points, if this function is f1 and this function is f2, or y1 and y2, if you would like to call them that way, then at this intersection point, let's call it x star, then at the intersection point, not only the value of both of these functions are the same, so it is continuous, there are two more conditions that you need. So y1 at x star is the same as y2 at x star. Also, y1 prime, the first derivative at x star, is the same as y2 prime at x star. And then y1 double prime, the curvature at x star, is equal to y2 double prime at x star. So these are... the smoothness conditions, okay? Using these conditions, you can determine these unknown coefficients, a0, a1, a2, and a3, because when you click, all you give Katia is the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate of these points. The coefficients of this, uh, these four coefficients for each section is going to be determined behind the scene, okay? So drawing an SP line is actually quite computationally demanding when you have a ton of points. But Katia is doing it behind the scene and determines all these coefficients through the smoothness condition. And also by determining the initial and the final slopes. So you need to know the initial slope and the final slope. Okay, so if this point is like x1 and this point is x2, you also need to know y prime 1 at x1 and y2 prime at x2 sometimes instead you might know y double prime 1 and y double prime 2 at the end points okay so whether you know the initial slopes and final slope or the initial and final curvature these two conditions also are needed to determine those coefficients so this is a mathematical thing, and uh, if you get into my Robotics 1 class, I ask you to write a MATLAB code to calculate all this for our robotics applications. But uh, just know that when you say SP line, it is a smooth polynomial curve, and in this type of software, they are all cubic third order polynomials. So I guess at this point, I have explained all different tools that I have in the profile. So now I feel a little better. And I know that I explained them and you know where and how to use them. I also explained for you the sketch tools, including a snap to point and construction elements. Okay, now it's time to look at the operation toolbar. So these are additional operations that you can do and basically further modify your sketch elements and entities and make it more complicated. For example, let's say you have a rectangle and uh, then you want to basically remove one of these sharp corners and round it. So the feature to do that is here called the corner. In other CAD software, we call it a fillet. So if you click on this and then click on the two edges leading to that point, then it gives you the curve and you can provide here the radius of curvature of that curve. And there we go, right? That corner is rounded. Another way to get rid of a sharp corner is using the uh, chamfer tool, which cuts it using an inclined surface. So here I click on this and click on that. And now you see that I can provide the length of the diagonal chamfer and the angle of the chamfer. Okay. That's another way, or I can do the uh, horizontal and vertical displacements, which we call them rise and run, if you remember. 
So there are different ways to determine those. And if I want, I can even leave the tangents, the original lines back here as a construction elements, okay? So if you click here, if I click right now, the original one's still there. If you want to remove it, you need to use this one, which does not leave anything behind. You can leave them as construction elements behind, or you can completely remove them, okay? So here, I click on this one, this one, provide the diagonal, provide the angle, and there we go. Okay, so that's another way to get rid of a sharp corner. Of course, always fillet is preferred. And the reason for that is one, to get rid of sharp corners and edges that might cut the hand of a worker. And second of all, or any person that is using the product, is when you have internal edges, okay? Let's say if you have an edge like this, a corner that is an internal corner, so something like, or even external, but there is a change in the cross section. So, okay, so one of the things we do is when you apply a load on the part at this internal or external edges where the cross section of the part does change immediately, something created called uh, stress concentration, which brings down the life of the part. So what we do, we try to create a fillet on those sharp features, okay? And that will help to basically increase the life of the part quite more than if we didn't do it. Okay, so we learn about fillet, we learn about uh, chamfer, then if you want to trim some stuff, there are trim tool, quick trim tool, and break tool. And these are very useful tools when you want to create complicated sketches. Let me show you an example here. So for example, if you know in an airplane, inside the wing of an airplane, there are two internal structures one of them is called a rib and the other one is called the spar and the cross section of the spars are uh, basically triangular kind of so the two edges of this cross section are straight and the two others are a part of the top and bottom espaline so basically like if I draw a line like this here and draw another line like that here, then this area between these is the cross section. And so let's say I want to get rid of these extra portions of these lines that are outside the uh, SP lines. Okay, how can I trim that? Or I want to get rid of the portions of these SP lines that are outside the linear region. So let's say all I want to leave is the cross section of the spar and nothing else. How do I do that? Well, if you use the quick trim tool and here click on this line, you see that extra portion that I don't need is gone. And you can repeat that for the other sections too, right? So there we go. It actually is a smart feature and it recognizes which portion should go. So it clears it all the way to the intersection point. But now if you do it on this one, you see, it also does the same thing on this curves. It just cleans them up all the way to the next intersection. And there we go. If you don't like these points, you can get rid of them if it doesn't mess up your curve, but it does. So here, this guy is, the cross section of a spar, which is an element, an in, in, uh, internal element inside the wing that is along the span of the wing. I'll show you a picture in a second, but uh, if you see the cross section is not a rectangle, it has two SP lines on the bottom and top and then two straight edges. So you can get it that way, right? Let me show you since I just mentioned it, I want to make sure. So ribs and spars wings. 
Okay, so if you look inside the wing, as I said, inside the profile of the wing, so this is the part of the wing that is attached to the fuselage, we call it the root of the wing. This is the part that is exposed to air, we call it tip of the wing. The distance between these two, we call the uh, span of the wing. And the distance between the front and the back of the profile, we call it the cord. Now, these uh, structures that are parallel to the airfoil and they are airfoil shape all the way from the uh, root to the tip. These guys are called ribs and then this longitudinal structure you can have several of them this is called the spar okay so inside the wings when you see you have ribs and spars these to reinforce the structure of the wing and then on the top of them is the skin of the uh, wing and you also attach the control surfaces aileron flaps and so on and so forth so just wanted you to know it so this is one application of using trimming and uh, let me show you another one maybe let's say you have uh, let's say a circle here right and then on the top of the circle, you have an arc like you have a profile like this. Okay, and now you want to get rid of this portion of the circle. So I click on it, and there we go. And what is this? If any of you know, let me draw a bigger circle for you. So if you know gears, and this is the shaft, and this is let's say the gear. Okay, so this thing here, let me just show you one teeth of the gear. It's just a rough, the teeth of the gear are more complicated, but, right? So this is a big gear, and then uh, this is the shaft inside the gear. In order to connect the shaft with the rest of the gear, what we use is one of the methods that we use is called key and keyhole. So this is the keyhole for which the key goes. And there is a similar thing inside the shaft. So this is the shaft here. And on the shaft, I have a similar thing. show you I want you to see the real life application of each thing instead of just me talking about it so uh, let me get rid of that if it allows me to there we go so this guy here is the shaft this big thing is the gear and this is the hole inside the gear the shaft goes and then inside the shaft on the shaft and on the gear we create this hollow area we call it the keyhole and then an element we call key comes and fill this area for me like this. Okay, and so it keeps the shaft and the gear running together, right? Let me get rid of this also for you so that we can see better, right? So this is key and uh, keyhole for gears. And let me also show you that since I'm here, gear key and keyway you might call it keyway instead of keyhole okay so that's what i said so this is a, a gear or any part this is a shaft and this is the key that attaches these parts together on real life gears you see that okay in many real life gears you see this small cut Okay, this is how you connect the gear to its shaft using this keyway and keyhole. So hopefully you understand better how to use this important feature. Now the brick, what brick does is it just breaks, it doesn't eliminate. Okay, so if I have, let's say an ellipse here, I can break this entire curve into two sub curves or three sub curves by applying a break at the locations I want. So I click on it and say, hey, break this here for me. Okay. And then also break it here. OK. 
Okay, so now let's see. This is one curve, this is two. And if I did on this one, let me put it on this one here. So look, I have one curve here, one curve here, and one here. And I can eliminate any one of them that I don't like, like that or this one. Okay, so uh, I can break a physical entity and eliminate or modify individuals separately. And then we have the regular trim tool, which gives you a little bit more options. So for example, let's say I have two intersecting lines, one like this and one like that. And then I wanna create a T-junction. So I wanna get rid of one section of this. So I can use the quick trim or I can use the regular trim. Now you can see here and the bottom on the sketch tool, it gives me two options. Do you want me to trim both elements after intersection or just one of them? If you want the T-junction, you use this guy, right? So you say this and just go there like that, right? Or you can say, well, no, I want you to just make an angle for me, right? So you get rid of this. Look, depending on which side of the line you go, you can keep that. There we go, right? So this trim gives you a little bit more option compared to quick trim, but quick trim is smart and you don't need to, once you click on the entity, it recognizes the best course of action. Okay, now we have a bunch of good tools here under mirror, very important ones, by the way. So I showed you, you can mirror something, right? So if I have a circle and then I have an axis of symmetry, remember for that you need an axis. And then you click on the mirror, then you choose the sketch and then the axis. There we go. You get the mirror feature, right? Now, another version of that is transfer or symmetry. So this one is not create a replica on the other side, it moves it to the other side, okay? So when you click on this and this, it's not gonna keep the left one, it moves it to the right one. There we go, okay? So this is quite different thing. You can transfer, translate an element in any direction that you want. You can rotate an element about any entity with any angle, you can scale them, you can offset them. These are all super important. Let's say, for example, I want to create a circle uh, concentric with this one with so many uh, units offset. So I go under offset. We use this guy a lot. And I click on this. Now, if I go inside or outside, I can provide what? an offset version of this. There we go, right? Or I can scale something. That's another interesting feature. So we can scale something up or down. So I click on the scale, say I wanna scale this. If you keep duplicate mode, not only it leaves the original sketch, it creates a scaled version of it as well. So if you don't want the original one to be kept, you just want to scale it, turn this guy off. If you turn it on again, not only it leaves original sketch, it gives you a scale version. So then you have to click here. It says click at the center of the scale. So I click here and then you provide the scaling ratio, right? If it's less than one, makes it smaller. If it's bigger than one, it makes it bigger. There we go. Right, you see the original one is not remaining, it's gone. So that's the scale feature. Then you can translate. You say, I want to translate this. Again, turn the duplicate mode off if you want. don't want two of them. And then now you have to provide the first and uh, last or beginning and end point of the vector using which the translation happens. So you say, I want, let's turn this, uh, uh, on say I want to go from uh, let's say I want to go let's say 50 units horizontal and 20 units vertical 
So you click anywhere you want, it doesn't matter, but now you make sure that the next point is 50 units to the right, 20 units upward, right? So if this is 500, you have to go to 550. If it allows, or let's go 500 and 200, since we scaled up the view, and then 200. So we should go to 1,000 and positive 100. So from here, we go to 1,000, and positive 100, something like that. And then it moves it according to the vector that you just made. And finally, you can rotate something. Okay, so it says select the geometry to be rotated. You select it, then it says select the center of the rotation. Let's say I wanted to rotate it about the origin. And then now it says uh, basically determine the angle. So you first create a reference line and then you rotate the reference line and the angle between the new line and the reference line is used to rotate your feature about the center of rotation. Okay, there we go. So these are extremely useful tools. Now, this one is called projection, and that's what I mentioned in the slides too. You can project a sketch on another plane or another surface, okay? Now, the type of projection here is only on flat planes. It's not on curved surfaces. You can do on curved surfaces, but not using this command. And I'll show you where to do that later. But uh, you can project one sketch from one plane onto another plane. Let's say, for example, here, I make this circle on the XY plane like that. Now, I want to create a plane parallel to the XY and then project this onto that plane. How do I do that? First, I need to create a new plane offset from XY. Where do I do that? So if you saw here, let me go back. This is what I had. First, you are in the sketch environment. In order to create another plane, you have to get out of the sketch environment. Okay, planes are created in 3D, not 2D. So if you want to get out of the sketcher environment, you click on this guy here second item from top right it says exit workbench so we click on this and now you are back to 3d then on the right hand side there should be a toolbar that has a point a line and a plane so let me get that for you that's this toolbar so this toolbar can create an arbitrary 3d point for you so this one, you provide all sorts of info and creates an arbitrary 3D point, an arbitrary 3D line. This is a 3D line, not a 2D. And a plane with special instructions. So here, I click on this plane. And if you look at the plane type and expand it, there are all different ways to define a plane. Offset from a plane, parallel with a plane, through a point, normal to a plane, normal to a curve, through three points, through two lines, through an equation, mid, mean through points, tangent to the surface, and so many other ways between. So if you have two planes, you want a plane in between them, you can use this one. Now, at the moment, I want the simplest case, offset from the plane. It says which plane. You choose the XY plane. And then you provide the amount of offset. So let's say I want 100 mil offset. Okay, let, let's make it a little bigger, maybe 400. So now you can see this plane. And this plane, similar to XY, YZ, and XZ plane, you can draw any sketch you want on. All you need to do is to click on this plane, which is now called plane number one, and then click back on what? The sketch tool. Once you do that, now you are back to what? The sketch, but uh, don't be uh, uh, 
confused by this view, it might look like as if the circle I initially uh, drew was on this new plane. No, if you click on isometric, you can see that. And if you rotate it, you can see that the circle was on the XY plane. Now I'm trying to draw it on this new plane. How do I do that? And let me again do it in isometric. Maybe that gives you a better visualization. So this is what I do. I use this project entity 3D element. And then it says, okay, what do you want to project on the new sketch plane on plane one? I say this guy. And then I say what? Project it. You see? I project this guy right onto this plane. And when I do that, there is a small difference between the projected version and what? The original one. What is this? Yeah, you can tell from the color. The original sketch is white, while the projected one is yellow. Yellow means what? Yellow means independent. It means dependent. I'm sorry. So the yellow one depends on the white one. In other words, if I resize and change the white one, the yellow one would change accordingly. So here, let me get out of the sketch. I go back to the original sketch. This is the original one. Just double click to open it back again. And here I resize it and make it off center. So I make it smaller and then I grab it and move it off center, right? Look what happens now. You see, the other one changed immediately according to that because it depends on this guy. It's the projection of that. But is there a way that you project something somewhere and then make it independent so that any change on the original one is not going to affect the new one? Yes. How? So when something is projected like this and it's yellow, one of the things you can do is you right click on this guy, on this yellow quantity. And then what? Go to mark one object and then choose this guy says isolate. Now you isolate this from the original one. And if you do that, now look, this guy is also white. Now this is separate from that. If I go back to this and modify it, the new one is not going to be affected. Okay, so this projection and isolation are quite important things that I also mentioned in the lecture for you, but I wanted you to see it here. Okay, so, so far we have seen how to use basically um, any of these two toolbars. the operation toolbar and the profile toolbar, as well as the sketch tool toolbar. Now I want to work with you and we go through constraint toolbar. That is very important. So let's say you made a rectangle. Okay. Let's say you made a rectangle like this. As I said, you can see that the lines, the edges of the sketch are white. And white means underdefined. So in Katia, colors, they have meanings. Okay, when something is white, when some sketch entity is white, it means it is underdefined. So you have not provided all the info that is necessary for it. Remember, if it was yellow, it means it was dependent. Or projected. Now, I'll show you two other colors. One is green. And the other one is purple. Okay. 
And by the way, if you had gray, gray means it was uh, with dash line, it means it was a construction element. But uh, what do I mean by underdefined? I mean that if you left click on any of these edges and drag, what can you do? I can move the rectangle and I can resize it. So I can completely mess up the rectangle because nothing is defined for it, not the size, not the location. Right? And do the same thing with this other edge. Now, can you also click on a corner instead of dragging an edge? Can you drag a corner and make one of these lines to be not vertical or horizontal? You can do it with a simple line, right? So when you have a line, if you hold a corner point, an end point, and drag that, you can change the angle of the line, right? But can you do it here with this rectangle? The answer is no. Why? Why is it that you cannot drag this corner and uh, change this line to some different angle? Because of these four things that you can see, on each line there is a small green thing, H or V, okay? H means it is horizontal, V is vertical. So it's not like your rectangle doesn't have any type of constraint. It does. The lines are forced to be horizontal or vertical. Using this kind of constraint we call a geometric constraint. So there are two types of ways that you can constrain and provide info about your sketch. One is providing dimensions. One is providing dimensions. And the other one is providing geometric constraints, okay? And I'll write them for you as well here. So the constraints, not only in Katia, in other software, that's the same thing. By the way, you see my handwriting is not super good because uh, it's really hard to write on laptop uh, monitor using a pen. But I found Microsoft OneNote to be a really useful tool. So we have dimensional ones, we provide dimensions, and I'll show you. And uh, the other one is geometrical. And I'll show you the difference between them. These horizontals and verticals are geometric constraint. Now, can I remove them? Yes, all you need is to click on those symbols. They go black and then use delete from your keyboard. Look, I removed this guy to be vertical. Now, can I change the orientation of it? Yes, just grab one corner and move. Look, now you made a trapezoid. Because now this guy is not forced to be a vertical edge anymore. So I can change the orientation of it. Can I force it back again to be vertical? Yes, how? So if I click on this line, then on the constraint toolbar, the top command, which is geometric constraint, if I click on it, it gives me all sorts of geometric constraint exist in Katia, and the one I want is what? Vertical. There we go. Now it's back. Now we cannot do anything. Okay, so this is one type of geometric constraint, and there are more, and I'll show you. But now, how do I constrain this rectangle? One of the things I need to do is to fix the size of it. To give a dimension to any sketch entity, we use the second command, dimensional constraint. And here I click on this edge and move my uh, dimension line above or below. But remember, a good sketch practice, uh, dimension practice is leave it outside, not inside. So I leave this guy outside. And so you see the size is 162, but let's say I don't want this number. I want it to be 150. So how do I change it? I double click on this. And then I type the number I want, and there we go, 150. And then I click on the other edge and provide the height also. Let's say I want this 50. So I made this 50. There we go. Now, or let's say 60 or whatever. Now, if I try to drag this rectangle, what happens? 
I can relocate it, but I cannot resize it because the size is now fixed. Okay, so I provided this. Still, they are white because I still can move them. They are still underdefined, but at least I cannot resize and I cannot change the orientations. So what should I do now to uh, fix this problem? I should locate the rectangle with respect to another fixed entity. And the only fixed entity I have right now is the origin and is 2H and V axis. So what I can do, I click on dimension, then I click on this line, and then I click on the edge. So I provide the offset between the two, like that. And I repeat this for, let's say, the right edge and the axis. Okay, and let's say I want it centered, so this should be 75, right? There we go. Now if you look, All of them are green. If I drag anything, nothing happens. They are fixed. They are what? They are fully defined now. Let me delete some of this, if you don't mind. There are leftovers from the previous lecture. I want to get rid of them. And we only focus on our lecture today. There we go. So green means what? You are right. It means it is fully defined. So let's write it down here. perfectly defined and that's the best practice always try to make your sketch fully defined so nothing would move it and resize it later okay now one thing we have to talk about here is about the units so i said this is 60 what 60 millimeter what if the units you are working is the british system you want to work in inches well, one way to do it is you type the unit here. So mm means millimeter, in means what? In inches. So let's say I want it to be 2.2 inches. And I can do that, but this guy will convert it back to millimeter for me because the default unit for me right now is millimeter. Okay, so I can type the number here if i want to with the units in means inches again and mm means millimeter right but uh what if i want to convert the default back to inches so that all of these numbers are shown in inches and when i type double click here i just say 2.2 and i don't need to type in in so it knows it's inches how do i change the default unit system to do that i need to go under tools options then I go under, if you can see here, under general, there is this tab called parameters and measurements, and then units. And here are all physical quantities that you can imagine in this software. And you choose the one that you want. Let's say it's length. You see the unit is millimeter here. If you expand this, you can change any other unit that you want. And let's say I want inches. There we go. You see, now everything is converted into inches. And now I say I want two. I want this to be one. I want this to be uh, three. And I want the other one to be six, right? OK. There we go. So you can convert your default unit system to anything else. And not just for length, for mass, for energy, for anything that you might see later, we can convert their default units. So this is fully defined. Now, uh, by the way, if you don't want any of these, you just click on it, highlight it, and then use delete. Okay, as simple as that.
Now, sometimes some people really try to make it all super good. They provide more dimensions than needed without noticing. So here is perfect, right? Now, let's say I also say the bottom edge is one unit from the horizontal axis. Well, do I need that? No, because the whole thing is two. This is one, so the other portion should be one. But if you do that and over constrain the sketch, what happens? So say here to here is one. You see, now you are purple. Purple means it is over defined. And Katia does not like it. If you overdefine and sketch a sketch, you cannot later use it to create 3D components. Okay, so if later I want to convert this into a 3D cube or something, Katia will not accept this over uh, constrained sketch from me. It doesn't like it. So if you see purple, that's not a good thing. Make sure you find something that is redundant and get rid of it. Katia does not like to be treated like a fool. Says, hey, I know that's one. Don't tell me twice. One time is enough. Okay, so make sure it's green, never purple. Okay, so I mentioned that for you over here. Now, uh, let's talk about some other ways to constrain. So, Let's say if you want to do it for a triangle, okay? So you have a triangle like this, and you want to constrain it. So let's say you want the angle between the two lines. How do you do it? You click on the dimension, you click on first line, and then the second line, and then you provide the angle. So I want this angle to be 50 degrees, and then I want this guy to be let's say 75 degrees and then the other third one will be determined accordingly of course and then let's say i want the size of one edge to be let's say three units okay so now the size is fixed you cannot resize it and now right so here we provide the dimensions and angles and now let's say i want one of these corners to be at the origin how do I do that? Well, you can provide zero offsets with H and V to this point. Or a better way to do it, instead of providing zero offset, is you click on this point. Then you hold down control. You do multi-select. To multi-select, you hold down control. And then you click at the origin. So now both of them are orange, as you can see. And then you go to geometric constraint and you choose what? Coincidence. Coincidence means they are on the top of each other. There we go. And now it's perfectly constrained. The symbol for coincidence is this circle that you can see. So whenever you see this hollow circle, that means there is some coincidence over there, right? Or let's say, for example, uh, let me get rid of one of these angles. Let's put this coincident back. Mm. So the angles are not perfectly defined. Now let's say I want uh, this guy to be parallel to the v-axis or be perpendicular. To the H. So how do I do it? So one way is this. I click on this line, then click on this line, and then go here and say I want the angle, of course not this, because I already made it 50. Let me make the other one 50, or 60 or so. So uh, you hold down control, select both, go to here, and then one of the other things you can choose is what? Perpendicular. You say, I want these two to be what? Perpendicular to each other, right? That's one way. Or you can say this guy and this guy are supposed to be what? Parallel, if it allows it. Okay? So you see here it does not because this is not a separate sketch entity. 
but if you want you could have selected this one and make it what force it to be vertical that's another way to do it or if I have another fixed sketch entity like this okay so I have this sketch entity and let's say this guy is fixed because I know everything about it I know its length I know the angle of it and everything like that correct and uh, let's say this point and this point are coincident then you can say hey I want this line to be and let's make this a construction element because I don't need this so I click on this guy and uh, let's see here I made it a construction element because I don't need it and now I want to force this guy to be parallel to this so I do a multi-select then I go here and I choose what parallel there we go anywhere you see this symbol that is parallel okay so there are all sorts of ways that you can make stuff constrained or let's say I have two circles this circle here of course I have to and then I have this circle here and I want them to be concentric so I click on this one I click on this one go here and then choose what concentricity there we go right so very easy if I choose equal then their size will be equal to right or let's say I have a line like this and I want this line to be a uh, tangent to this circle so I click both choose both then use what tangency there we go so there are all sorts of things symmetry midpoint and so on and so forth that uh, I can do in Katia and with a combination proper combination of dimensions and what geometric demand geometric constraints and dimensional constraint with the proper combination of these I can make any sketch to be what fully defined very well now so I mentioned that for you uh, so there are a few things left but uh, let me talk about let's say an ellipse ellipse is an interesting one so if you want to fully define an ellipse let's say here I center it at origin and I do this and that and I have an ellipse clearly it's white so it's not fully defined so how do I fully define this okay as you can see it is not fully defined although I kind of implicitly mentioned the size of it by clicking on some points but still it doesn't like it it says provide dimension so uh, now if I click on the dimension and click on the ellipse it allows me to define the uh, major diagonal dimension like that now note that I can double click here and type a different number but you're gonna see something weird happening look I want it to be 8 inches instead of 866 look what happens oh <laughs> right that becomes very very weird why because by clicking on uh, this uh, points that you use to define the ellipse you already determined that major semi uh, major diagonal you see here you have a major uh, radius you are determining so if you want go ahead and say four in here okay and you also have a semi minor radius and an angle right so let's say I want zero angle and then semi minor of two and radius angle of zero right like that yes if you type all of the numbers and enter you're gonna be perfectly fine but if you don't do it then just click okay like this so do not enter then although you implicitly define the dimensions still you see it as white 
So now, if you use this guy to make it green and provide dimensions, do not change this number because that's based on where you clicked. Do not do that. So here is a major diagonal size. What about the uh, minor diagonal? What's the size of that? If I click on this again and click here, it doesn't let me define the minor diagonal. It again goes back to major diagonal. So how do I force this to show me the minor diagonal size? So in order to do that, you have to right click before you left click and fix the dimension, because if you do it, you're doing one dimension twice. And if you see the second one now has a parenthesis around it, which means basically that is just redundant. So don't do that. Instead of left clicking and fixing the dimension, right click to give a contextual menu and then choose what? Semi-minor axis. And now you determine the semi-minor. And although this guy is at center, this is centered at origin, the dimensions are fixed, still white. Why do you think this is still white? So the reason is the orientation of the ellipse is not shown clearly here. So if you want to make it fully defined, you have to show that orientation. And one thing you can do is you click on dimension, then you click on the ellipse. And then here, if you click on the Y axis, then it shows the angle between semi-major diagonal of the ellipse with the Y axis. So if you force it to be 90 degrees, it means the uh, semi-major is horizontal and therefore now the orientation is also fixed. So making an ellipse green using the dimensions could be a little bit tricky if in the beginning you don't enter the numbers and fix it. Okay, but uh, anyways, you can get the thing done. Okay, so now uh, we learned that each color means something, right? Each color means something. Green means fully defined, purple means overdefined, and so on and so forth. Is there any way that I can uh, change these default colors and then uh, change the auto constraint method? What is auto constraint? Let me first mention it and then we come back to this question. So remember, when I created the rectangle, although it did, I did not provide dimension or anything, but it forced these lines to be horizontal and vertical. So it did a little bit of constraining for me in the beginning. This is called auto constraints. Could it draw a rectangle for me without this HNB? Yes. But I activated the CATIA option to do some of these auto constraints in the beginning. Can I remove it? Sure. Can I change the color of those default, defaults for fully defined, over defined, under defined, and so on? Yes. Where? That's where we go back to options. So here, if we go to tools, options, and then we click on mechanical design and then sketcher. Now, not only we can change some other stuff like grade and so on, which I'll talk about. If we go here under uh, geometry and under constraint, under constraint especially, you see it says, do create geometric constraint and dimensional constraint for me. If I uncheck them, you're gonna see Many of those constraints are not going to be there, even though you uh, basically enforce it. And I'll show you in a second. So let's just uncheck them, see what happens. The other thing I said, the color of default entities, these are under colors. So you see default elements are white, but if you want, you can change the color of default from this point on to be what? Maybe... Um, uh, Let's use a different color that we don't have, maybe uh, orange, no, brown. And then if you click here, 
you can say if it's fully defined or iso constrained then make it red if it's over defined instead of purple make it what dark green and so on and so forth so you can change the default colors if you want to and look now if i draw another rectangle first of all you clearly see that the color changed and second of all you see that h and v that always Katia creates for you when you do a rectangle are now not there. Yeah, so it doesn't do auto constraints for you. And I changed the color of default elements. Okay, so you can mess up with this stuff if you want to or if you have any preference. But I really do not recommend you change it unless you have a very good reason to do so. So let's go back to the default thing. And um, so I showed you change the units. I showed you change the constraints. Uh, I mentioned the uh, construction element. Now, let's uh, talk about the grid very fast. And then we talk about and display. So we need to talk about display and grid. And then we go back and uh, finalize it about Okay, now that we have a good sketch, how can we exit the workbench and convert it into a 3D part, which is the topic of part design actually, but we need to do some basic thing on it in order to know about the sketch analysis, which is uh, here. So uh, let's, as I said, uh, we need to look at the uh, grid customization and uh, talk about the uh, display performance. So what is that? So uh, if you see here, if I go back and change my units back to uh, millimeters, what is the size of each grid cell? And how many of them do I have here? So if you look, if I zoom out, you see that the grid is divided into big squares like this, right? You see them next to each other. And then each big square is divided into a lot of what? Tiny squares like that. So what's the size of the biggest squared? Clearly you can see that they are all what? 100 mil by 100 mil. And so the size of the small ones, there are 10 of them in each direction in a big one. Each one is 10 by 10, okay? By the way, each one of these small divisions, small squares, we call them a graduation. Yes, graduation but it has nothing to do with your fourth year graduating from here. So it means gradually changing basically. So now can I change the number of these small divisions from 10 inside the 100 by 100 mil to 20? Can I make, make it a finer grid or a coarser grid? Can I change the angle of them from horizontal vertical to something else? Yes, I can. I absolutely do not recommend you do it, but you can. So uh, let me show you. Go to Tools Options and go back again to Mechanical Design Sketcher. Here is the grid. You can turn it off. You can change the size of each one of those uh, big squares. Instead of each one being 100 mil by 100 mil, you can make them like 300 by 300 and how many small squares are inside each, you can change the graduation. You can turn the snap to the point off and on. You can allow distortions, which is uh, non-vertical and horizontal lines. I don't absolutely recommend doing that. But let's say if I make it to any and go back now, I have 20, 20, 400 of them inside one of the big squares. Okay, so now each one of the big squares, if I can see them well, so it's 100 mil by 100 mil. Uh, 
let's see so this is like three by three so now to the point is on so you have to zoom in a lot to see them but you see clearly yeah now you can see better as i said it's gonna mess up things so make sure you know what you're doing so now this hundred by hundred is now as you can see uh, doesn't does include 400 smaller squares okay so again don't do it unless you have a good reason so i changed the number of graduations i can also turn the grid off if i don't want to have the grid well when i'm drawing a sketch i can go back and turn it off okay so here i put this back to 10 but i say don't display that for me there we go it's gone okay you can bring it back if you want but uh, I prefer personally to have the grid instead of not have. It gives you a sense of the dimensions you are trying to create without going to dimensions, right? So when you do your initial sketch, it gives you a sense of how well you are doing, how big the sketch is. So personally, I prefer the grid to be there. That's one thing. The other thing is display quality. So here, if you see a circle, appears quite as a circle to me, right? It is. It doesn't show a bunch of dents, and it is a nice, relatively nice circle. Now, in reality, a cat software can never draw a perfect circle for you. What it is is a polygon with so many edges. Now, if you change the number of edges that is used to draw a very good approximation of the circle, the more edges you use, of course, the smoother this guy would look like. So if you, can, if you have a magnifier and you can zoom into this area, let me show you, you clearly see the jaggedness, okay? You clearly see that it's not perfectly round, which is okay, but... Uh, under tools options you have the control over this so if you go to tools options and go under general go under display and then uh, visualization or uh, actually performance i'm sorry here you have the accuracy of showing 2d and 3d entities and the smaller this number is the more accurate the visualization and the performance. So you're going to get closer to an actual circle. You clearly see here, this is a polygon. So if instead of uh, 0.2, I make this 0.01, and this one also 0.01, I can see very smooth circle. On the other hand, if I make this 0.6, and maybe this one too, 0.5, then this is going to be even more jagged. I don't know if you can see it right now, but it is quite badly jagged, actually. Yeah, I can clearly see the ends of the points. I can even make it still worse if you want, okay, so that you can really see that it is a polygon. So let me make this point to nine. Let's completely mess it up. And now, I assume you can see if you make it bigger, you probably see it better, or maybe smaller actually you see it better. Yeah, so now you can clearly see the uh, polygon, right? So what's the big deal here is, the big deal is uh, the performance and the graphic card that you have. If you have a very good RAM and good graphic card, you can afford to uh, make the uh, curves smoother and look nicer because your graphic card is fast and can afford it. Now, if your graphic card and your RAM is not super uh, high fidelity, then you would see that doing some basic task in CAD will take forever. Okay, so I don't recommend really making this too coarse or too fine. 
some people choose to go 0.01 and 0.01 on each make it like the best there is but then as i said it takes forever to do some basic tasks now when is it that it's good to make them as fine as possible that's when you want to convert your CAD file into a mesh file like STL that is used by 3D printers and you want a very nice smooth mesh that is very similar to your actual part and that's where you want high performance in converting your part to a mesh file and not only that takes a long time to convert your CAD file into a mesh file also the size of the mesh file is significantly more than your original CAD file. Your CAD file might be a few megabytes or even kilobytes, while your uh, fine mesh file could be several gigabytes. Okay, so don't go fine unless you really have to do so. And don't make it super coarse. I guess default numbers 0.2 and 0.02 for 2D and 3D accuracy in CATIA are good numbers. Uh, so I mentioned that. Now, finally, I made some sketch. I made it fully defined or so. And now I want to convert it into a 3D object, right? So let's say here I made a profile. And then I want to convert this uh, profile into a 3D object, right? Now, sometimes your uh, sketch might look like it is a closed sketch, but it's not. It's actually open. Now, the gap might be too small that you can barely see. So here, there is a gap, but it is actually very, very what? Small, as you can see, I zoomed in to create a small gap that you cannot normally see when you do fit all in. And you are under the impression that this is a closed sketch. And so what you do now, you exit the workbench by clicking on this command. And then you go back to the part design and then you click on the extrude command, which here is called pad. But you see MATLAB gives you an error. Say, so, hey, this is an open profile. Do you want to convert it into a thin object or what? And you don't want that because even if you do, it still gives you error. So MATLAB does not, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know why I said MATLAB. Katia does not like open profiles. Katia only wants closed profiles to be converted into 3D. So what should you do? If you go back, double click and go back to the sketch, you might know that, yeah, there is somewhere open, but where is it? And what can I do about it? First of all, how do I know where it is? Because this might be a very big sketch with too many details, and I cannot use this guy and zoom into each and every corner of it and find it. I can, but it takes forever. Is there a way to directly point me to where the open profile is? Yes. If you go under tools, this guy says sketch analysis. Once you click on it, it tells you what's wrong with your sketch. And when you click on that, it actually shows you where the problem is. You see it here? Not only that, it gives you corrective actions. It says, hey, you can convert everything to construction elements, which is not a good idea because construction elements cannot be converted into 3D objects as well. Or it might suggest that you it can close it for you. So you say, hey, close it. And now look, it is closed. It could close it for me. And look now, if I zoom in, there is no gap, right? Now I can exit. And I can click on this pad and convert it to what? A 3D object, right? So when is it that my sketch is not useful for creating 3D parts? One, if it's open. Two, if it is construction element instead of actual. So if I convert this whole thing to construction element, 
right? When I get out, let me get rid of this. Although this sketch is there, when I get out, I don't see anything to extrude. Because construction elements, as I said, are not actual sketch entities. They cannot be used to create 3D parts. So construction elements cannot be used. Open profiles cannot be used. And also if what? Remember, you make it over-defined. If you make it over-defined or over-constrained, it does not like it. It doesn't allow you to make it 3D. So make sure you avoid these three common mistakes and always before exiting the sketch go to tools sketch analysis and look for uh basically if there is any openness or any error problem find them warnings are okay if it says warning you are fine if it gives you error you are not fine and see if it allows you to correct it or if it locates it for you and you do it yourself, okay? Now, if my sketch is not fully defined, if it's underdefined and white like this, can I use it and create 3D parts? Yes. So, oh, so underdefined sketches can be used for, so, sketch errors, that prohibit 3D features, feature constructions. Open sketch. Over constraint or over defined. Sketch, which is purple, and construction elements. Elements only. If you have construction elements and some other sketch entities, that's fine. As long as those other ones are closed and not overdefined. So construction helping other elements is fine, but if it's only construction elements, you're not going to do it. And final thing is under define sketches can be used to create 3D features. So under definedness is not a big error. It's not really an error. Okay, it's a preference. We as professionals want to have over uh, fully defined sketches. Okay, fully defined is always preferable.